Hello. This is going to be a video uh, that goes over uh, Plato's Phaedrus. Um, I'm going to remind you, I make a distinction between Socrates and Plato that uh, some people disagree with, because basically all we have of Socrates is what Plato sort of recorded in his writings, because Socrates spent all of his time arguing in the Agora and conversing with people. Plato was present for many of these arguments, so uh, the dialogues in the, the, the Five Dialogues book, at least four of them, um, seem to be Socrates' position. Uh, in uh, the Phaedrus, we find a character Socrates arguing things that the Socrates we just met in the Apology and the Crito would never argue. Um, it's what we're going to get in this argument it is an argument for the existence of a soul and that soul being immortal um, or at least more durable uh, than the body uh, and a positive treatment of uh, metaphysics, right? The, the, the underlying nature of truth, right? Unlike the previous uh, Socrates where we, we uh, came to understand that he was the wisest man in Athens because he knew that he did not know, right? And out of that, that Socrates developed a positive ethics out of a negative epistemological claim. I don't know, but this is what we should do given the condition of not knowing, right? So um, it, I, I tend to think it's a fairly decent um, distinction. I'm not the only one that makes the distinction between Socrates and Plato. But um, nonetheless, uh, it's understand that largely what we know of Socrates um, comes through um, Plato, um, it, save for the fact that we know has, is historically a person by the name of Socrates who was strange, fairly ugly, um, existed in Athens and was executed um, after trial um, for corrupting the youth and not believing in the gods of the state, right? Um, just a couple of closing remarks on Socrates before we start in with this new dialogue. Um, Socrates' treatment of democracy is an interesting one. It's, it, it, just to review from the previous video, uh, it, recall that um, there are two arguments that pertain to democracy um, in Socrates. Largely, um, democracy is not something for Socrates that was a good in itself, but rather something we have to argue to rather than argue from democracy, therefore, versus uh, the way Socrates did it, human capacities. We have this human capacity, the most distinctively human and most noble of our capacities, to reason. Right? And a good political arrangement is going to be the one that both depends on and respects our capacity for reason and self-rule. Therefore, democracy is, as far as we know, the best kind of political arrangement that we can come up with. Right. So, but nonetheless, what we saw from Socrates in both the Apology and the Crito was a critique of Athenian democracy insofar as people were not exhibiting a tendency to follow reasons to their conclusions. You see, Socrates thought of a democracy as one large think tank, right, where if it functions properly, when it functions properly, the best elements of the human beings that are involved in this kind of project of self-rule are engaging in public debate, right? Engaging in philosophical discussions about justice and virtue and what should be done and evaluating reasons and being persuaded by reasons and listening to one another and allowing themselves to be open to arguments. You see, this kind of democracy depends on a kind of philosophical argument wherein we are open to the argument. That is, we are really collaboratively with one another trying to figure out what's truest or best. We're not just trying to win an argument. An argument in the democratic sense and an argument in the philosophical sense as far as Socrates was concerned, go hand in hand. We have the capacity for self-rule insofar as we can engage in these discussions and collectively through 
a giant sort of democratic think tank conclude what's best for all concerned and then enact the conclusion of that argument right, in terms of policy or practice or what have you. Right? So this depends, by Socrates' account, on our epistemological position. We don't, no single one of us, knows what is best. We don't know the truth. We don't have a knockdown argument. We are fallible. But if we collaborate and cooperate with one another in this kind of public discussion and debate, which is the highest of our human sort of endeavors, right? then collectively we can come to better conclusions than we can individually. Right? So uh, this depends on a whole bunch of factors that in, Socrates would be very concerned about today in terms of our political life, where we tend to isolate ourselves within our silos, listen to the arguments that tend to verify our opinions or beliefs, argue from our camp in an attempt to defeat the other camp. Right? There's no dialogical sort of activity that goes on and he was very concerned about the democracy in Athens falling prey to the same kind of opinionated silo kind of action. This is the root of Socrates' critique of the opinion of the majority. Well, most people argue, right? Well, you're in the minority if you're arguing that, right? That's not a valid kind of argument. What most people think is not valid. Let's look at the reasons and see if they're sound and see if the inference from those reasons to the conclusion is sound. Right? That, that is the way that each of us are required and expected in the context of a democracy to engage with the issues that affect all of us. Right? Problematically, right, as we turn to Plato, Plato was a whole lot more skeptical, as I was indicating in the previous video, about the nature of a democracy. Right? Plato saw that the same kind of tendencies in Athens as Socrates did. He saw a people too willing to rest in their dogmatic slumbers, too willing to opine belligerently, right? neglecting reasons, refusing to have arguments, um, sort of a sheepish, sheepish collective sort of mentality where I'm part of this group and this group argues this and we believe this and none of your reasons are valid kind of thing. It's basically just mocking the position of the person standing next to you, right? They're not mocking, mimicking the position of the person standing next to you. Well, most people think this. Well, they say that, right? Most people believe. Well, no. Socrates argued that we should and have the capacity to overcome our emotions and reason through it ourselves. We should think for ourselves and demand of other people that they think for themselves. Socrates' whole position um, and his account of why he was so poorly liked in Athens depended on him actually drawing that kind of argument out of the people that he was talking to. It's a very uncomfortable sort of thing to engage in if you're not used to it. Right? So, for example, right, um, if, for example, I, I were to ask you, well, what is freedom? You know exactly what freedom is. Oh, freedom is being able to make whatever choice I want. But no, 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 no. Is freedom being able to simply act out whatever desire you want? Or is freedom the freedom to choose despite your desires? Well, I don't know. That complicates matters. And if I put you on the spot for that kind of an argument, right, what that would demonstrate if you weren't able to rise to the, the, the occasion is that which you thought you knew very well at the beginning of the argument, you turned out not to know. You thought you were wise when in fact you were not. 
right? So all Socrates thought he was doing is trying to enhance people's understanding of the issues and problems that they encountered in their everyday lives through demanding reasons in the way of justification for their beliefs. What you wind up with on the other side is stronger beliefs. Elaine de Batons, um, in the Socrates video that I gave you, uh, self, Socrates and self-confidence, he gave you the, uh, the metaphor of the clay pot kind of thing, um, wherein you're testing your beliefs constantly in order to construct a belief that will ultimately hold water. Uh, that's that's from the Mino, actually. So um, <clears throat> that that is where Socrates was trying to go. Plato, on the other hand, was very concerned that in the context of Athenian democracy, at least, but more deeply in the context of human capacities, most of us will not be able to overcome our desires in this way. And remember that that element of moral psychology that I introduced to you, uh, along with the Socratic dicta in the previous, knowledge is virtue, knows that know the good, do the good, and evil arises as an involuntary error due to ignorance. The one thing that Socrates can't handle, given that understanding, if those that know the good automatically do the good, and evil is as a result of ignorance only, because you don't know any better, Socrates, with that kind of moral psychology, cannot handle people that know better, but bloody go along and do it anyway. Right? So, it, it, largely, what Plato adds to Socrates, and we'll see it come out in the Phaedrus, there are other dialogues that I could use to bring this out as well, is an element of moral psychology that allows for an explanation of how people can know the good, but still, to some extent, fail to do it. Right? And it, just, just an indication, it, it has to do with desire. Right? Our desires overcome our better elements. Right? Uh, you want an example? I can give you an example. Um, a long time ago, I wanted to buy a new car. I wanted this car. It was red. It was a Jetta. Right? It was a nice looking car. And I wanted this car. All signs kind of pointed to no. The price was eh, not so expensive that I couldn't afford it. Right? But expensive enough that it was going to hurt me a little bit to buy it. But I wanted this car. So. I put down a down deposit on this car. It needed things to pass a safety. So the guy I was buying it from right, took it into a shop to have it safety. But that shop turned out to be a long way away because he's got a buddy with a shop long way away that's going to do this. And well, it got to the shop and it had additional problems and he didn't have the money to fix it. But I'm not buying the car unless it's fixed. So he asked for more money. I knew I shouldn't give it to him, but I wanted that car, so I gave him another $1,500 in the way of a deposit huh? for this car. He got those things fixed up, and he drove the car back. On the way back, the car died and wound up in a garage back in my hometown. And the guys at the garage said, I don't know, it doesn't work. It doesn't run. It doesn't. Sometimes they just get to the point where they don't want to run and that sort of thing. So here I am having paid half the value of this car with a car that won't run. <laughs> you see, it's one of those, I wanted this car, even though I knew better to engage in these kind of business transactions and that sort of thing, but just oh, desire overcame my rational and self-controlled elements and led me into error and stupidity. All right. Now, more abrasive um, examples of that are going to come out as a result of our reading of the Phaedrus, which has to do with love. And um, just in a way of a preface to this, if you look at it's largely it, the first two, there are going to be three arguments in the Phaedrus. The first two have to do with a pretty severe critique 
of erotic love. It's problematic in a lot of ways, and if you look at the domestic abuse kind of statistics in Canada and the U.S. currently, you'll find a lot of evidence to support what Plato, lo those many years ago, those many millennia ago, was arguing here. It's amazing how consistent the problems with our erotic kind of relationships are. Mm -hmm. So there seem to be some real problems with Eros. The third argument that we're going to encounter in um, the Phaedrus has to do with Plato's formulation of how love can actually be beneficial. Right? So ultimately, we're going to get two critiques of love and then an account of love, which, by Plato's estimation, is the only kind of ethically justifiable beneficial to both the, the lover and the beloved, um, and uh, philosophically gratifying as well, or spiritually gratifying if you want to think of it that way, kind of love that we can encounter, right? So largely, ultimately, where this argument is building is to a defense of love. And we've got some distinctions and a few arguments to get through before we get there. So um, this video will come in three parts. Um, uh, the first one will have to do with an argument from a famous Greek orator by the name of Lysias. It's sort of the telephone game that we're playing here. Um, so we have a character by the name of Socrates in Plato's Phaedrus, um, who I tend to take as sort of a hand puppet for Plato's ideas. Right? It's as though I were to um, put on a Socrates costume and make an argument myself as though Socrates were arguing it. Yet that argument is mine. Right? That's essentially what Plato is doing with the character Socrates here. Um, we have the title character by the name of Phaedrus, who um, is a youth, right? um, who is not a young boy, but has not taken on the responsibilities of manhood yet. Right? Um, and it, we get sort of a flirty feel between Socrates and Phaedrus, but it's, Socrates was, was not a romantic companion of Phaedrus. Um, uh, we get a certain degree of flirtation implied between Phaedrus and Lysias, whose speech Phaedrus has been listening to all day, and whose uh, Lysias' speech is the one that Phaedrus then recounts to Socrates, and then they have their first argument. Um, uh, so it's a bit of, we, we never meet Lysias in this dialogue except through the speech that the character Phaedrus, the title character, recounts to the character Socrates. Right? So effectively what Plato is doing here is using literary devices to convey a, a series of philosophical arguments. Right? So um, in that way, uh, the, 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 these dialogues are nice in so far as they're almost like plays. They draw the reader in, um, they make it engaging, that sort of thing. But in order to distill what's coming out of this argument, um, it, we, like what Plato is trying to argue in the like little better than half of this argument that we're going to go through um, in general outline, I'm having you read to the top of page 49. Um, for this, um, but um, nonetheless, um, it, what we're going to have to do is distill Plato's position out of these literary devices that are going to give you cues right, as we read through. Right? So, um, it, like I say, three videos. One is uh, Lysias' speech. Uh, the second one is Socrates' first speech, as though that is not confusing enough, right? The second argument is called Socrates' first speech. And um, then the third argument um, is going to be Socrates' second speech. So I know it's confusing, but we'll follow through, right? Ultimately, where we are building to is Socrates' second speech, where Plato gives you his position, right? So um, th th that is where we're going with this. So, um, these dialogues start out 
uh, with a lot of meet and greet. Right? Um, in this particular case, Socrates bumps into Phaedrus, Socrates. Phaedrus, my friend, uh, where have you been? Where are you going? Oh, Phaedrus, he's been kicking around at Lysias' house listening to remarkable speeches. And you know what? I'm going to go outside the city walls and sit and try to practice my speech writing and, and, and think about this speech. Would you like to join me? And Socrates, oh, well, you're promising me a speech. I don't usually leave the city walls. But nonetheless, I'm going to go with you. And then they go down this stream, walking barefoot through the stream and find a little nice pleasant meadow to sit and everything's supposed to be a little bit fantasy and romantic and that sort of thing. And it's supposed to actually situate Socrates outside of an environment where one is comfortable, two, we generally find him. These are cues for you to understand that one, Socrates is going to be engaging in, at least initially, in arguments that produce discomfort in him. Two, that this is not going to be your typical dialogue right, involving Socrates because he's outside the walls. Where did Socrates argue? In the marketplace, in the Agora. Right? So ultimately, what Socrates is going to do right, is make a very strange series of arguments. Right? They're in this meadow, and these nymphs lend, uh, let, uh, uh, drag the princess, enticed a princess away up the way, and that sort of thing. And it's, it's all sort of strange. And Socrates doesn't want to engage in this sort of mythical sort of reformulation and that sort of thing, but does a little bit. Right? Um, anyhow. Ultimately, there is a little battle of wills between Socrates and Phaedrus. Phaedrus, who wants to practice his speech-making skills and um, recite this speech from Lysias from memory, right? uh, to test his memory and uh, develop these skills. Socrates it cajoles him and says, well, you know, I'm not going to allow you to, 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 to practice on me like that, especially when I suspect you've got the speech itself straight up your tunic there. What's up your sleeve, Phaedrus? And ah, there it is. All right. So Phaedrus then reads the speech which Lysias has written down to Socrates, All right. because Phaedrus is very impressed by this speech. Socrates, as we'll see, less so. Right. So um, it's all the way on page seven by the time it, the dialogue starts in earnest with the argument that Lysias is going to make. Just quickly, this is um, in, in, well, the cultural practice um, in terms of relationships, in terms of sex, in Athens especially, but it was a Greek practice. Um, it, like the couple and a half of millennia ago this was written, um, it was that the kind of romantic relationship that would be truly fulfilling for um, Greek males right, would be that between an older man and a, a, a younger man. Right? So this is decisively a a Greek love kind of relationship between male and male. Um, the theory there being, it's, it recall the, 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 the sort of false argument um, from the, the previous video that I laid out to you. The, the thought was that women are useful in many respects, but they're not fully rational. So if you want a relationship between equals, or at least people of equal capacity, then that relationship would have to be between a man and a man. It was a cultural conceit, and like I say, um, the, the presuppositions there persisted until like 150, 200 years ago. Uh, when, when was it women were, 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 were respected enough to be given the right to vote in both Canada and the United States? Historically, compared to the distance between us and this dialogue, it's like five minutes ago. Right. So I, we can get on our high horse about a number of things about this, but nonetheless, right, structurally, this argument um, fits any kind of relationship where erotic desire takes hold, as we'll see. Right. Now, the argument from Lysias 
argues to the conclusion that you should avoid the lover, someone who loves you, and give your favors to a category of person that he, 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 he terms the non-lover, right? Somebody who does not love you, right? So I, the non-lover is not, it's, it's, it's not casual sex. It's not romantic encounters. It's not that sort of thing. What, what, what Lysias and uh, ultimately in the second speech were Socrates first speech, the second speech that we're um, going to uh, read through the argument is not an argument in favor of a casual or callous or flippant sort of relationship to sexual encounters, but rather more like a strong friendship with benefits kind of situation, right? Someone who is not erotically overcome, but someone who is sexually interested yet, you know, in control of themselves. So that's basically the structure, right? And a strong friendship with benefits is what the non-love relationship seems to, to, to encapsulate here, right? So the argument starts off, and it's quite clear that this argument was, was constructed by Lysias to persuade Phaedrus, right? And I've got a note up here that says it's an inductive argument. An indu indu inductive argument is the kind of argument we usually make, right? One where the premises are meant to work together collectively to provide strong, but not necessary, strong support for the conclusion, right? Here is a list of reasons that should be persuasive to you in order that you accept this conclusion. We're going to contrast this with the kind of argument that Socrates um, makes in uh, his first speech, right? When he makes an argument, he's going to make what we call a deductive argument. One where uh, the premises provide necessary support to the conclusion. The distinction between these kinds of argument is sort of interesting. In an inductive argument, all the premises can be true, yet the conclusion can still be false. In a deductive argument, if the premises are true, the conclusion necessarily follows. Right? All men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore, dramatic pause, Socrates is mortal, right? You see, if all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, the conclusion of the argument is necessarily that Socrates is mortal, right? It's a deductive argument. Whereas what we'll see from Lysias here is an inductive argument, and your cue um, to the fact that you're getting an inductive argument happened um, all throughout the preamble, where um, it, it, you know it's, they've been laying this out with um, uh, with the terms uh, what is likely, what seems to be the case, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So overwhelming evidence of the inductive sort, right, that could strongly support the conclusion, yet not necessarily, right? The premises can be true, yet the conclusion can still be false. That's that's what we're going to get from Lysias here. But nonetheless, um, I suppose I should point out to you that most of the arguments that we encounter in our lives, what we get from the newspaper, what we get in court cases, um, what we, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, seems to be inductive, right? Most of what science actually, the, the data overwhelmingly points to a conclusion, but the conclusion is still not necessary, right? So it's, it's, Large, largely, um, it, much of science, say for the mathematical kind of sciences, is inductive, right? So, anyhow, page seven, Phaedrus, listen then, Lysias' argument. You understand my situation. I've told you how good it, it would be for us, in my opinion, if this worked out. In any case, I don't think that I should lose the chance to get what I'm asking for merely because I don't happen to be in love with you. 
And then what follows is a series of about 11, I count sometimes, there are some that are twofers, right? Um, it's, I, I, I sometimes count 11 lines of argument that all sort of have this structure to them. Lysias is going to point out a problem with love, well, a problem with the lover, right? Then point out that this issue is a non-issue, it's not problematic with regard to non-love or the non-lover. Therefore, you should avoid the lover and give your favors to the non-lover. Now, there's a note really early on here that um, it, what I'm asking for, yeah, footnote 20 on your page 7, is sex. Right? It's sex. They're, they're sort of funny about actually saying the word sex. It shows up later on in the dialogue, but nonetheless, initially, there, it, Plato is really funny, right? Or Lysias, at least, is really funny about using the term sex, coming right out and saying it, right? But nonetheless, that's what we're talking about, right? Now, I'll just spot check a few of these. There's no reason to go through all 10 or 11 of them. Um, there are a few that are uh, amusing. There are a few that are um, strong arguments. There are a few that are important arguments. And um, I'll just pick out four or five. Right? We don't have to labor through them. You read them. But I'm just going to illustrate how this structure winds up working to collectively support this conclusion. So there are all of these lines of argument that all support this one conclusion. <coughs> so the first one, the man in love will wish he had not done you any favors once his desire dies down, but the time will never come for the man who does not love you to change his mind. That is because the favors he does for you are not forced, but voluntary. <clears throat> and he does the best that he possibly can for you, just as he would for his own business. All right. So here's a problem with the lover. Once his desire dies down, he'll wish he hadn't done you any favors. You know those moments when it's, I remember I was dating someone and they weren't happy in their job, so I pulled a number of strings because I was in love in order to get them a job at a university that I was working at. Right? And once that relationship kind of went south, oh my god, I, I regretted that. Not because they were there, I barely saw them that sort of thing, but because I went through all of that hassle, what, for this ungrateful person? For this ungrateful person? But if the reason I did that wasn't because I was in love, no problem. I've helped people get jobs in the past. Eh? I don't envy them, I don't regret doing it, and that sort of thing, because I'm taking care of their business like I'm taking care of my own business. I'm just doing it because they're a friend, and hey, I hope that works out for you. It doesn't work out? Eh. Oh well, it didn't work out. No skin off my back. But, nonetheless, but, because the reason I was in love, right, regretted it after. Right? Think of all those things you've done for your ex. Yeah, I know. It's starting to boil in your blood a little bit, that sort of thing. Now think of all the favors you've done for a good friend. you regret any of those? No, it's not the same kind of thing. All right. So, it seems to be a strong argument here. Here's a problem with love. You're going to regret the favors that you've done because they're not forced. They're voluntary. You're not going to regret the favors that you've done for the person you're not in love with. All right. Over the page. All right. I'm going to go all the way down to... Boo, 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 boo. Oh, yeah, why not? 231Z. Besides, suppose the lover does deserve to be honored because, as they say, he is the best friend a loved one will ever have. 
and he stands ready to please the boy with all those words and deeds that are so annoying to everyone else. I love you, no, I love you, no, you hang up first, no, you hang up first, hooby gooby schnooby. You see, this one's kind of a twofer, right? Those words and deeds that are so annoying to everyone else. It's easy to see that if he's telling the truth, that the next time he falls in love, he will care more for the new love than the old one, and it's clear that he'll treat the old one shabbily whenever that will please the new one. You see how that's sort of a twofer, right? Well, first off, here's, here's, here's the two arguments. Here's a problem with love. Those words and deeds are so annoying. I love you, I love you. It's not a problem with non-love, right? Because you don't talk to someone you're not in love with that way. Okay? Therefore, you should avoid the lover and give your favors to the non-lover because it's not annoying to everybody else. And then the second part of the, um, the, 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 the argument here, you know, all those wonderful things, those words and deeds that you say to the person you're in love with? Well, the next time you're in love with somebody else, you're going to treat that lover shabbily, uh, the, the previous person you were in love with, shabbily. Oh, that's just my ex. Why she go away? Oh, geez. Okay, this is awkward. Let's get out of here and that sort of thing. You know, just act belligerent and hope he or she leaves, that sort of thing, right? Say nasty, hurtful things about them, that sort of thing. Hope it pleases the next person you're in the relationship with. Whereas this issue is not an issue in a relationship where you're not in love. Therefore, you should avoid the lover and give your favors to the non-lover. It's an odd tendency, but it occurs. It occurs. Eh? So, seems like a fairly reasonable argument. Now, here is the um, most important argument um, in uh, this, 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 this Lysias line of argument here. Uh, right by 231D on uh, page 8. And anyway, what sense does it make to throw, something like, uh, uh, throw away something like that on a person who's fallen into such a miserable condition that those who have suffered it don't even try to defend themselves against it. A lover will admit that he's more sick than sound in a head. He's aware that he's not thinking straight, but he'll say he can't get himself under control. So, when he does start thinking straight, why would he stand by the decisions he, was, he, he had made when he was sick? Right? So, lovers are sick in the head. It's like a sickness. It's like a form of craziness. It's a madness. Think of all the metaphors we've got in our culture for love. Right? I'm madly in love with you. I'm crazy in love. Right? That sort of thing. And think of all, all the dreams of trashy romantic literature about this. Shakespeare was writing about people that are so crazy in love that they, 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 they're willing to die for one another. Right? Teenagers. Right? We're still writing this kind of tripe, right? With the Twilight Saga kind of thing. I met you five minutes later, I would die for you. That's, that's, that's not right in the head. That's not right in the head. And actually, if you look at the study of endorphins, you will find that for the first something like two years of a relationship, you're, when you're in love, your body is pumping out these endorphins, so you're like literally hi you're not reasoning correctly love is a form of madness you're crazy in love you make all sort of promises when you're under the influence of that love but when your desire desires dies down why would you keep them eh? why would you keep them oh i was crazy when i was making those promises you don't actually want me to do that do you whereas the person who is not in love keeps their wits about them. Therefore, you should avoid the lover and give your favors to the person who does not love you. Okay, we're just doing two more. Right? One because it's funny. And the other one because it's a strong argument. 
All right. The next one is over on page nine, the one directly following the one that I just read. Another point. If you were to choose the best of those who were in love with you, you'd have a pretty small group to pick from. But you'll have a large group if you don't care whether he loves you or not, and just pick the one who suits you best. And in the larger pool, you'll have a much better hope of finding someone who deserves your friendship. So love, it limits your options. If you care if they love you, you get a small pool. If you don't care if they love you, the sky's the limit, man. You could just have strong friendships with benefits. And it's likely that you'll find someone who deserves your friendship versus somebody who's pitter patter about you and otherwise braggadocious and untrustworthy and, you know, that sort of thing. And likely to regret the favors that they've given you and not right in the head, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So the smaller pool limits your options. The bigger pool, sky's the limit. Here's a problem with love. It limits your options. It's not a problem if you don't care if they love you. Therefore, all right, bada bing, bada boom. Now, the final one, it's sort of a long passage uh, towards the bottom of nine over to ten. Um, but nonetheless, I think this is a fairly strong argument that it will hit home to a lot of you. Right. Another point. Have you been alarmed at the thought that it's hard for friendships to last or that when people break up, it's ordinarily just as awful for the one side as for the other. But when you've given up what's most important to you already, sex, that is, then your loss is greater than his. If so, it would make more sense for you to be afraid of lovers. For a lover is easily annoyed and whatever happens, he'll think it was designed to hurt him. That's why a lover prevents the boy he loves from spending time with other people. Never encounter that? <laughs> I know I have. He'll be afraid that the wealth, wealthy men will outshine him with their money. Well, the men of education will turn out to have the advantage of greater intelligence. And he watches like a hawk everyone who may have any other advantage over him. Once... He's persuaded you to turn those people away. He'll have you completely isolated from friends. And if you show more sense than he does in looking after your own interests, you will come to quarrel with him. So, man, lovers are jealous. There's a tendency in a love relationship when love has overcome the better elements. Right? You're all pitter-pattery and that sort of thing. For the lover to isolate you from your friends and your loved ones, etc 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 and if you show more sense than they do you're going to wind up in a fight you're going to wind up with a fight well i don't want you hanging around with that person anymore oh yeah you're not the boss of me etc etc it's a big ugly fight whereas if a man does not really love you i'm back on 10 here if it's only because of his excellence that he got what he asked for then he won't be jealous of people who spend time with you. Quite the contrary. He'll hate anyone who does not want to be with you. He'll think they look down on him while those who spend time with you do him good. So you should expect friendship rather than enmity to result from this affair. Lovers are jealous, man. They want you all to themselves. Whereas the non-lover, they're just friends, and friends have friends, and eh, more the merrier, that sort of thing, right? You know, it's perfectly natural for people to have friends. Eh? So, you should avoid the lover, give your favors to someone who doesn't love you. Eh? So, that's the way this argument works. And I'm sure you've read through the whole thing, and you see the way these lines of argument actually work together to provide very strong support for this conclusion. It's if you consult your experience and your relationships, I'm sure you'll find that there are a lot of these problems. Lovers aren't jealous, man. You know, 
when you're in love, you do wind up once your desire di dies down and once the relationship goes south, south, regretting all of those things. I don't believe what I did for this person, right? Lovers are braggadocious. Lovers are more sick than sound in the head. You ever think to yourself, what the hell was I thinking in that relationship, right? You know, well, you weren't thinking because you're high on endorphins, right? Once your desire dies down, you get your wits back about you. You say, oh, man, whoops, right? Etc. cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It really does seem like a strong argument. Lysias is hitting on experiences that, like, reaching two and a half millennia into the future. I've experienced. I've experienced these things in relationships. So it seems like a fairly strong argument. Socrates, on the other hand, disagrees. Right? First of all, Socrates argues that Lysias just argued what the situation demanded. In other words, Lysias offered a persuasive argument in order to convince Phaedrus to have sex with him. It seems like a persuasive argument, right? He said what the situation demanded. Um, over on 12, um, but who, and not, it, 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 he said what the situation demanded, and uh, not instead simply on the ground that he had, he had spoken in a clear and concise manner with precise turn of phrase, if we must, I will have to go along for your sake, because surely I'm so ignorant that it passed me by. I paid attention only to the speech's style, a form of argument. The other part, uh, as to the other part, I wouldn't even think that Lysias himself could be satisfied with it, for it seemed to me, Phaedrus, unless, of course, you disagree, that he said the same things uh, two or even three times as if he didn't really have much to say about the subject, almost as if he weren't very interested in it. In fact, he seemed to be, uh, uh, to me, to be showing off, trying to demonstrate that he could say the same thing in two different ways and say it just as well both times. Further down, um, Socrates um, it, it mentions that offhand, right, he could probably make an, a, a, another speech that's better than Lysias's on the fly, though we can't credit himself with it. Right, he's probably heard it from some of the Sappho or Anseron or some writer of prose or something along those lines. But he knows his own ignorance. He doesn't think it came from him. But he could probably make a speech that's better than Lysias's on the fly. Right, at which point Phaedrus challenges him. Okay, let's hear it, Socrates. You can make this speech without repeating a word page 14, from my book, right? And, you know, then you'll win. Socrates points out that, no, no, hold on, hold on, Phaedrus. There is one point that is essential to make in, in Lysias' speech, right? That has to carry over to the speech that Socrates is um, going to make. Page 14, you're a real friend, Phaedrus, as good as gold to think. I'm claiming that Lysias failed in absolutely every respect, and I can make a speech that's different on every point from his, I'm sure that couldn't happen even to the worst possible author. In our own case, for example, do you think that anyone could argue that one should favor the non-lover rather than the lover without praising the former for keeping his wits about him and condemning the latter for losing his? Points that are essential to make and still have something left to say. So, Effectively, this is the single argument from Lysias' speech that Socrates considers to be essential. So what Socrates has to do now is construct a speech that reformulates and strengthens Lysias' argument. Right? He's going to take the form of the content, the subject of Lysias's argument, and formulate it in a much stronger way, right? In order to provide a better speech, he's going to take that one line of argument, 
praising the uh, praising the non-lover for keeping his wits and you know ba basically critiquing the non-lover for losing theirs right and that's going to be central to Socrates argument right now on page 16 he points uh, points also out that, um, that 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 Socrates is going to be so embarrassed of this argument that he's going to um, cover his head while speaking. In that way, as I'm going through my speech as fast as I can, I won't get embarrassed by having to look at you and lose my thread of argument. Later on, he points out that the other reason for covering his head is kind of shame because his Socratic daemon is going to be screaming in his ear, no, Socrates, don't argue this, don't argue this. Which leads to an interesting point. Uh, and um, it relates to something an old professor of mine used to publish on. It, it, it's called a dialectical obligation right? that we have when we argue with other people. And there's something Socratic about this, but Plato actually puts it quite nicely here, right? <coughs> in the form of the dialogue that he's having here. Lysias made an argument to a point, right? But inductive arguments are really easy to push over. And you've been probably thinking about this yourself. This is, this is an easy form of argument to um, critique. Here's a problem with love. Here, this issue is not a problem with non-love. Therefore, you should prefer the lover to the non-lover. Even with 11, even with 21 arguments of this sort, you could take all of those reasons and say, yeah, you know what, I see what you're saying here, but it's, I still don't agree with your conclusion because there's still something about love, isn't there? Isn't there? Right? It's not a very strong argument. Right? You could go, uh-huh, 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 through every line of argument, yet still reject this conclusion. Right? Inductive arguments are easy to say, uh uh to. So why would Socrates make his job harder? Why would he strengthen this argument, which he clearly doesn't buy, which is clearly not where he's going with regard to his own position, which he's so embarrassed that he's got to cover his head in order to make this argument. He's literally putting a bag over his head in order to get through this argument. Why would he strengthen this argument? Well, when I argue with people, right, and I'm concerned with the Socratic Platonic kind of argument and actually getting at what's best, right, and trying to, you know, really get at something with the argument. I'm not just trying to win when I argue. Right. I'm trying to see the other po person's point of view and reason through to the best conclusion. But sometimes I encounter people who argue like Lysias, presenting sort of a weak argument for their conclusion. If it's a weak argument for their conclusion, and I can push it over fairly easily and say, ha ha, I'm right and you're wrong. Well, we haven't really advanced the cause of trying to figure out what's truest or best. In order to do that, what you've got to do is strengthen that argument. Right? So if I hear somebody making some weak argument for a position that's got some merit, I'll say, okay, I don't like how you've argued that, but there's something to what you're arguing. What you're saying is this, that, and the other thing to this conclusion. Is that kind of where you're going with that? Yeah. And another thing, oh, okay, then I can build on that argument and make it. Now, okay, once we're done making that the strongest argument we can, we can then test that argument and critique it. Right? And if the position after it's been made as strong as possible is still kind of shaky, then that strong evidence that it's a position, a conclusion that is false or unacceptable in some way. 
right? This is what an old professor of mine, Ralph Johnson, called dialectical obligation. When there are missing premises in an argument, in order for that argument to con be consistent or something along those lines, missing inferences or unclear sort of formulations of things, we've got a bit of a duty to go back and actually strengthen it into a position that makes some sort of sense, because you can't possibly be, be arguing that, because uh, that doesn't stand up. Are you arguing this? Yes, that's stronger. Okay, then we can have a conversation about it. That's what the character Socrates is doing in this dialogue by Plato. So, um, this is video one. Um, that's Lysias' argument right, uh, for why it's better to have casual relations than fall in love. Um, I will point out, and I'm going to be harping on this point, um, it, this argument is, uh, it, the three arguments that we're looking at, this dialogue is really a dialogue about desire. Right? And again, like I began with here, it relates back to the problem that, that Socrates saw in a democracy where people were emoting and opining their way through their act of voting. I'm angry, so I'm going to vote. Right? Well that's, well, that's harmful to a democracy, actually. A democracy depends on people putting aside their anger or their desires or that sort of thing and reasoning towards what's best. That's in order for a vote to mean something, have something behind it, right? That's what a democracy depends on, right? So voting alone is not enough in the context of a democracy. Right? You've got to reason and dialogue with people in order to overcome your own, you know, dogmas and prejudices. Right? Think in a real consistent way about what is best and then vote. Plato thought, and we're going to see this as this comes out, that, you know, there might actually be something structural in a human being that prevents us en masse from doing this. Right? Are most people sufficiently in control of themselves to actually vote in this manner in the context of democracy? Are the multitude capable of doing this? If the answer is no, then we're not capable of self-rule and democracy might not be the best form of government for us. All right? And ultimately, what Socrates, or Socrates, what Plato, unlike Socrates, wound up arguing is that really it's going to be a certain minority within the multitude that are capable of controlling themselves and acting on the basis of reason. These people would be the best suited to ruling within a society. So, who should rule? Everyone, the masses, probably not if they can't control themselves and actually engage in this kind of all of the fundamental necessities to engage in self-rule. The best should rule, right? The ones that are most rational in control of the, in control of themselves should be the ones that rule. So. Effectively, we're going to find something structurally similar coming out, as we'll see um, in the third of these speeches, that it's Socrates' second speech, that um, we're building towards. Right? So, but nonetheless, desire is the problem that Plato is trying to encounter with this particular dialogue. All right, video two will be um, Socrates' first speech.